tonight, a massive aid package approved with huge implications for the wars in Ukraine and Gaza. The bill is passed. Oh. A dramatic day as U.S. lawmakers push through $95 billion in foreign aid. Ukraine is fighting for its life every day against Vladimir Putin. Calls to de-escalate tensions in the Middle East as a Canadian aid truck is bombed in Gaza. How do we ensure that this never happens again? A chatbot you can't avoid. This is essentially being forced on billions of users and they have no way out. Concerns over Meta's new feature users can talk to. Plus, a fascinating fossil find by a father-daughter duo. No other marine reptiles got as large as these animals did. Uncovering the jawbone of a gigantic prehistoric sea creature. Oh, that's just an exceptional find. CTV National News with Heather Butts. Good evening. Some of the world's most volatile conflict zones are getting billions of dollars in new aid from the U.S. tonight. A rare Saturday session had lawmakers on both sides of the aisle coming together to approve almost $100 billion for Ukraine, Israel and Taiwan. CTV's Tony Grace reports. On this vote, the A's are 311 and the nays are 112. The bill is passed. An overwhelming and emotional vote. Flag waving on the floor is not, is not appropriate. But it breaks a months-long deadlock, greenlighting $61 billion in U.S. aid for war-torn Ukraine. We are the leader of the free world. It requires us to lead. Republicans were split. We should be funding to build up our weapons and ammunition, not to send it over to foreign countries to kill foreign people. But didn't have the numbers to stop it. $95 billion approved altogether. The $61 billion for Ukraine includes $23 billion to replenish U.S. weapons, stocks and facilities. There's also $26 billion for Israel, with $9 billion of that earmarked for humanitarian needs. And $8 billion for the Indo-Pacific, including Taiwan. It's the potential to turn the tide in Ukraine, protect our ally Israel and deter China from attacking Taiwan. President Joe Biden says the move advances national security and sends a clear message about American leadership on the world stage. Ukraine's president calls the aid vital, saying it will stop the war from spreading and save thousands of lives. And now the U.S. is stepping up again, so that's tremendous good support for Ukraine. The Ukrainian-Canadian Congress says it will have a broader impact. It tells us that, the again, the people who are running uh, the governments in the West understand the importance of defending Ukraine, understand that without Ukraine, Russia will be on NATO's border. And believes Canada could also do more, such as manufacturing munitions. Since 2022, Canada's pledged $4 billion in military aid for Ukraine. The Prime Minister discussed the broader conflict today with the President of Poland. It's important to continue to step up and, uh, and be there wherever it is needed. Your leadership on Ukraine and the way we stand together. President Biden has promised to sign the new aid package as soon as it's passed by the Senate. And that could happen, Heather, as early as Tuesday. Tony, thank you. And as part of that package, the Senate will also be forced to consider a potential ban on social media app TikTok, with House lawmakers tying the issue to foreign aid. It puts pressure on Senate lawmakers to vote on the whole package that would force TikTok's Chinese parent company to sell its share in the app or be banned in the U.S. Canada is keeping a close watch on the outcome. We're hearing tonight from a Canadian charity that says its key water aid truck was bombed in Gaza. The organization is urging the federal government to investigate. It comes as world leaders call for de-escalation. CTV's Colton Prale reports. Water is a scarcity in Gaza. Humanitarian groups are working to provide basic life necessities throughout the enclave. But there are new concerns after a Canadian water truck was bombed in northern Gaza. You know, reports from the field suggest that, you know, there, there were Israeli tanks in the area, right? So we want to know, hey, well, did this happen intentionally? No International Development and Relief Foundation aid workers were injured, but the organization says it's calling on Ottawa to investigate the incident. We want to ensure that, number one, 
that, that we have that level of protection and support, um, at least from our government's perspective, to say, hey, look, we are going to be holding uh, folks accountable for what's, what's going on here. That's really Canada is already being urged to investigate another recent strike, a deadly Israeli bombing that killed seven aid workers, including a Canadian citizen. Today, a funeral for one of the victims was held in Poland. It shouldn't be that we have to put this much time into uh, trying to ensure safety, trying to ensure that people are following uh, international law, humanitarian law. Earlier this month, Anera temporarily paused aid delivery, looking for more certainty of their safety. The question hasn't been fully answered. I don't feel fully comfortable that we're back working and that our staff are out delivering aid. The humanitarian concern comes as international attention is focused on Iran and fears of a regional war. Experts say that looks less likely after a muted Israeli response. I think we're seeing clearly that both sides are trying to de-escalate at this point the conflict. The problem is though they're not the only actors in the region that want uh, potentially want conflict. A spokesperson for the Minister of International Development says Ottawa has reached out to Israel about the incident involving the water truck. Ottawa says attacks on humanitarian aid workers and operations are unacceptable. Colton Prale, CTV News, Ottawa. Healthcare workers from across Ontario and Quebec rallied on Parliament Hill protesting the worsening humanitarian crisis in Gaza. We see medical personnel that have been killed, ambulances, hospitals destroyed. Dressed in scrubs and spattered with red paint, they laid on the ground as a symbol of those who've been killed in the war. Carrying signs, protesters then marched through the city. The massive fire that sparked a state of emergency in a Labrador town is now under control. The cause is still unclear, with investigators in Happy Valley Goose Bay unable to access the site. Given the uh, nature of the fire and the size, there's a tremendous amount of heat still uh, in the, uh, the old hangar. Uh, so I'm not really sure when they would uh, be able to get in there safely. Flames took hold of several buildings at the former airport in northern Labrador last night. Explosions catapulting metal debris hundreds of feet through the air. The state of emergency has been lifted with residents allowed to return home. Firefighters and first responders are expected to remain at the scene for several days. If you use social media, you've likely noticed a new addition. Meta has created an AI chatbot for people on Facebook, Instagram and WhatsApp, intended to help you search. For some, it's an unwanted guest. Here's CTV's Kamal Kramali. You may have noticed a new friend on Facebook. Problem is, you probably never invited them. It's kind of creepy. Meet Meta's new AI assistant for Facebook, Instagram, and WhatsApp. And in Canada, 45% of our citizens use WhatsApp. We're talking about a tool that has the power to shape the Canadian public discourse. For many, this will be the first foray into the world of chatbots. Here to help you from finding recipes to generating pictures included on your social media apps, whether you like it or not. So if you go into the setting, there's no way to turn it this off. So uh, this is essentially being forced on billions of users and they have no way out. It's already finding itself in some bizarre exchanges. One joined a Facebook mom's group. The AI chatbot claimed it had a gifted child. It also tried to give away non-existing items in an online exchange forum. And that has social media users concerned about their privacy. Just sort of do your best to navigate it and teach your kids how to identify it. Some even changing their social media habits. So are you going to stop using Yes, it? for sure. You're going to stop using yes, social media? That's habits. right. But experts say it's nearly impossible to escape. If you have already downloaded any of these meta apps, you have already signed your rights away. The information could be used to curate what you see on your home page, help inform meta of your online patterns, even supply it to advertisers. So clearly if you're using these companions to search for information that may be a bit sensitive or information you don't want getting out there, Meta will be able to mine that information. There's also concern it could be used as a new tool for hackers. I would be pretty shocked if we don't see sort of social engineering scams at, at some degree of scale sort of based on this technology. In a statement, Meta wouldn't say exactly how that information is used, just that this is new technology and it's working on improving those features. Heather. Kamal Kramali in Toronto. 
Canadians with disabilities are sharing their disappointment after the government announced funding for a new benefit meant to help pull them out of poverty. But advocates say the individual payments are far from beneficial. CTV's Annie Bergeron Oliver explains. A new disability benefit promised to lift hundreds of thousands of Canadians with disabilities out of poverty. But potential recipients like John Reddins are skeptical it will make a dent. It won't benefit me at all. It's a day-to-day -day struggle. What, what, can't be, what can't be paid and what can't be paid? Lucky I live in an affordable apartment, but uh, I, it's not subsidized. I pay market rent like everyone else. The federal budget allocated $6.1 billion over six years to the Canada Disability Benefit that will be distributed by CRA. The maximum payment, though, just $200 a month, or $2,400 a year, and it only applies to people 18 to 64. I think there's always more to do, but I will say, you know, if you look at the budget, this is the largest single, uh, you know, largest uh, single item that you will see. Ottawa is calling this a major milestone that will bring people above the poverty line. Advocates say the benefit alone isn't likely to do that. Most disabled people in this country get 30% below that poverty line or almost $1,000 less. And living with a disability costs more. So in fact, disabled people are not even lifted out of poverty if we just reach the official poverty line. Thousands of people with disabilities who are straddling that line use the Daily Bread Food Bank. They were already with us before the pandemic, and they, they were with us during the pandemic, and sadly, they're going to be with us after. CEO Neil Harrington hopes the government is truly committed to improving the benefit. We will work with the government to say how can we, as step two, move that needle forward so that nobody uh, needs to have to rely on friends, family, and charity in order to get their, uh, their most basic needs fulfilled. Applications for the new benefit will open in the coming months, with the first payments expected to go out in July 2025. Annie Bergeron Oliver, CTV News, Ottawa. A New Brunswick man wrongfully convicted of murder has died just months after being exonerated. Walter Gillespie served 21 years in prison after he and friend Robert Mailman were convicted of murder in 1984. The men were eventually released on parole. The co-president of Innocence Canada, who took up their legal fight, says the pair spent four decades fighting to clear their names. It was quite a weight lifted off of their, their shoulders. Unfortunately, Mr. Mailman uh, has serious health issues and Mr. Gillespie was 80 years old. So we knew that they weren't going to get to enjoy the type of freedom for very long. We hoped it would have been longer. Innocence Canada says Gillespie died in his home in St. John, New Brunswick. As companies switch to online services, some brick and mortar banks are now closing, a challenge impacting many who rely on in-person support. CTV Sarah Plowman on the small town pain in a digital age. In McAdam, New Brunswick, tradition moves through town and how people pick up their mail or money. But the only bank is leaving. So we're really, we will miss it. Disrupting the lives of seniors like 91-year-old Joy Kneebone and her husband Terry, who can't bank online. We're illiterate when it comes to what these young people can do. Joy's eyes aren't what they used to be, so Terry drives. The closest branch is an hour away. They're always saying how they're trying to help the elderly stay in their own home and help the elderly do this and that and then turn around and make it very difficult for us. Scotia Bank plans to close more than two dozen branches across Canada. It calls the decision difficult, saying with customers' preferences changing and more day-to-day -day banking being done digitally, we continue to evolve. McAdams mayor is seeking a compromise like an ATM. That people then can go and at least get cash or they can make a deposit. So those discussions are ongoing. Nakawick will also lose its only bank in June. The scales have tipped away from the customer and towards the shareholder and you know they've, they've made their decision and they're not going to back down. So There's talk of opening a credit union but that would take time and money. For some the change makes banking inconvenient and more expensive. It costs to drive to the next closest branch. From where I am it's 40 minutes. Business owners who rely on the service daily are frustrated. We can't, I can't do my deposits online. For some, the local branch wasn't just a business. We walk in and they say, good morning, Joy, how are you? How, how nice is that? A comfort she's about to lose. Unless they reconsider and have heart 
and realize that it is a necessary thing for us. Feedback from one longtime customer. Sarah Plowman, CTV News, McAdam, New Brunswick. Coming up, breaking the all-time attendance record for women's hockey. Drawing a capacity crowd at Montreal's Bell Centre. Plus, preparing for Earth Day with the cleanup capabilities of an inspiring teenager. The Professional Women's Hockey League has scored big in its first season. Today's game in Montreal at the biggest hockey arena in North America shattered another attendance record. Here's CTV's Olivia O'Malley. This is the sound of history being made. 21,105 fans filled the Bell Centre to capacity to see Montreal's PWHL team take on Toronto. We want the world to see that we'll pay to come see an event. Yeah. We can fill an arena this size. Not only will they pay, but many people traveled hours to be here. This group from Toronto saw the previous record-breaking game at Scotiabank Arena. We had to come here. We had to come here. And these women drove from Nova Scotia, spending 12 hours in the car. It's a super overwhelming feeling as a female growing up playing hockey in Newfoundland, Cornerbrook, Newfoundland, uh, yeah. where our hockey team was 12 to 21, and we're in a at the Montreal Canadiens Arena in a sold out for a PWHL game. That's huge. Fans had to act fast to be here. Tickets to watch the game at the largest hockey arena in North America sold out in a matter of minutes. It's amazing. Like I remember when I used to see games before, we were maybe like 100 and now like this is crazy. Like I wasn't expecting this. I'm really excited because it's my first time and I love hockey. No! When both teams were introduced, yes, even a Toronto team in Montreal, the crowd went wild. Players say it was pretty emotional. It was surreal. Um, when I kind of stepped on the ice when we first got introduced, uh, the whole team, I was, my jaw was on the floor. The support everywhere has been incredible. Uh, I never dreamed of playing at the Bell Centre, but that was one of the best experiences that I've ever had. Memorable for players and fans, including Jacques Sylvestre. It's a special day, very special day. He's passing his love of the game on to his granddaughters. It's the first time with my the four women of my life. My granddaughter, my wife, and my daughter. Players and fans say they want to continue to promote women's hockey so they can play in front of crowds this size on a consistent basis and record-breaking games will take place regularly. Olivia O'Malley, CTV News, Montreal. Women's wheelchair basketball is also shining bright for Canada, punching a ticket to Paris this summer. Dominating the competition, they secured a spot at the 2024 Paralympic Games. Still ahead, a fascinating beach find. The bones of an ocean titan identified as a new species. British scientists are getting a good glimpse at an ancient creature that lived around 200 million years ago. A father and daughter discovered the massive jawbone belonging to what's likely the largest marine reptile. Here's CTV's Alison Bamford on the jaw-dropping discovery. No other marine reptiles got as large as these animals did. Illustrations show a giant ichthyotitan severnensis, a prehistoric marine reptile that lived more than 200 million years ago. Oh, that's just an exceptional find. Now more proof of the animal that paleontologists consider to be a new species of ichthyosaur, also known as fish lizards. 11-year-old Ruby Reynolds and her dad Justin spotted a piece of jawbone fossil along a British beach in 2020, the same type of bone found by another fossil collector a few years earlier. Based on that unique shape, various different structures, 
the fact that they're both right from the end of the Triassic period, about 202 million years ago, supports our identification of something entirely new to science. The extremely rare finds are now documented in a new publication, suggesting the ichthyote titan lived 13 million years after any other known ichthyosaurs, and the monstrous animal likely survived until global mass extinction that doomed several other species at the end of the Triassic period. It's quite remarkable to think that gigantic blue whale sized ichthyosaurs were swimming in the oceans around the time the dinosaurs were walking on land in what is now the UK. Only the reptile's jawbones have ever been unearthed, but researchers determined its appearance based on its family members, including a species from British Columbia. Scientists hope to one day complete the massive puzzle and find an entire skeleton, or at least the skull. Alison Bamford, CTV News, Regina. Well, also extremely rare is winning the lottery. But for some people in Ontario, it'll soon become a reality. Several winning tickets for last night's Lotto Max were sold in the province, including one for the $70 million jackpot sold in Toronto. Check those tickets. After the break, from a basement business to an industrial park, the young Canadian working to help divert waste from landfills. We leave you tonight with a little inspiration as we near Earth Day. A young Newfoundland man wanted to help divert waste from landfills. Now he has a booming recycling business. Here's CTV's Garrett Barry. Another day, another delivery to 15-year-old Ryan Easton's industrial yard. Today, some broken and discarded washers for a few bucks. He'll take these appliances, strip them down, and sell off the steel and copper wiring that he finds inside. I find it interesting taking apart the appliances, figuring out how they work and that. Each delivery is a little bit more diverted from Canada's landfills. And from last August to the end of December, we did about 200,000 pounds of scrap steel. It's a hobby that Ryan started three years ago in his parents' basement that's now grown into a business in an industrial park near St. John's. Watching some videos about people doing it, like recycling stuff, and I found it pretty interesting and decided to start it myself. Three years ago, I was having a fit because he was, like most kids, on screens in the basement. And mom and mom be saying, okay, you know, trying to get him to do stuff, and all. But now he's gone full circle, and seems like there's no stopping him. And his new lot stores cars, TVs, snowblowers, thousands of pounds of steel waiting to be processed. This weekend, heading into Earth Day on Monday, it's his biggest of the year. An annual event brings computers, printers, and cell phones through these doors. Last year we did, we had a whole dumpster load, 12 cubic yards of stuff. And this year we're hoping to do a lot more than that. It's become a pretty time-consuming after-school job. Ryan says he's got no interest in slowing down, him or his father. I'm going seven days a week now. Even the guy I work with said I should come back to work and get a break. Care Perry, CTV News, now Pearl. That's our show for this Saturday night. I'm Heather Butts. For all of us at CTV National News, thank you for watching. Good night, and I'll see you again tomorrow.